because I'm one of those people with a gift for counting, I counted it was exactly a bunch of months ago uh, that we had a town hall meeting to discuss uh, membership requirements that our church has in our bylaws. And after the town hall meeting and subsequent discussions in cabinet and discussions between Pastor Brenda and me, Pastor Brenda and I decided to hold a spread out sermon series where we would occasionally preach on some subject around the issue of membership and baptism and that each of those sermons would have an opportunity for a post-worship discussion for people to talk about what we had brought up in our sermon. A month and a half ago when I was making plans for sermons in September, I decided, hey, the 23rd of September, that's a great day to do one of these sermons. So I thought today we would do one and we're not going to have a post-worship service discussion about the sermon because there's a other post-worship discussion happening today that is equally important about uh, our church and how we can more fully grow into our open and affirming covenant. And to be honest, as I've worked on this sermon and thought about the series, I think that it will make more sense if we do them all together. And so this sermon is going to happen when Pastor Brenda returns from sabbatical. She and I will schedule another series probably sometime in the spring. In the meantime, I hope this sermon stands on its own as well as being a sermon that we can refer to later when we get to the series. As I thought about how we might discuss the appropriate membership requirements for a church to have, a church like ours that embodies or at least attempts to embody God's radical welcome, I realized we should probably start by talking about what it means to be church. So that's the topic for today's sermon. So I want to start by talking about Rotary International. And I pick Rotary International because they do good work and because they are an organization that is in several ways like the church. And if we can identify how the church is different from Rotary International and other service clubs or other organizations, we might better understand what it means to be church. So, similarities. Rotary International has local clubs, Rotary clubs. The church has local congregations. Local Rotary Clubs bring people together for fellowship and mission, like local churches do. Though perhaps not as diverse as the community it is in, your average Rotary Club will include people with diverse skills, backgrounds, interests, and gifts. The same can be said for local churches. Rotary Clubs unite dedicated people to exchange ideas, build relationships, and take action. The same can be said about local churches. Rotary clubs work on projects locally that make lives better for their neighbors, and they work collectively on lives around the world to make lives around the world better, which the church, when it's living out its mandate, does as well. From a legal point of view, Rotary is a nonprofit corporation, as are churches. Like Disciples of Christ Congregations and United Church of Christ Congregations, a Rotary Club is a membership corporation. People join their local club. People join their local congregation. And local clubs and congregations are connected to wider networks of clubs and congregations. A lot of similarities between the two. In fact, Rotary generally meets weekly, as does the church. At a Rotary meeting, Rotary Club meeting, they typically will have a presentation on a topic that is of importance to the community, which isn't quite a sermon. And that is where things start to diverge. This is where we can start to glimpse what makes the church different from a service group like Rotary. But here's the difference. The God thing is the defining thing that makes the church 
the church. We don't gather for a meeting every week. We gather to come into the presence of God and to offer God our worship every week. We gather to be in community together in our praying, in our listening for the living word of God and in our seeking to respond to that word that we hear. There are other communities that gather to be in God's presence and to offer their prayers that aren't churches. Jews gather in what are called synagogues and Muslims offer, they can offer their five daily prayers anywhere, but they try to gather together to offer prayer at least occasionally and places called mosques. The thing that makes churches gathering for prayer different from these other communities that gather for prayer is Jesus. We found that Jesus offers a way of approaching God and of hearing God's living word that works for us. John Shelby Spong famously said, God is not a Christian, God is not a Jew or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist. All of those are human systems which human beings have created to try to help us walk into the mystery of God. I honor my tradition, I walk through my tradition, but I don't think my tradition defines God. I think it only points me to God. I would add, he by the way is a retired Episcopal priest, I would add that while my tradition doesn't define God, it does help define me. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Jesus. And that may not be what most of you think of as Jesus, but anthropologists think that is probably closer to what Jesus looked like than most of the paintings we see in the United States and Europe. So if Christianity defines me much more than it defines God, it's important to remember that Jesus didn't start Christianity. Like many others, I don't think that Jesus was trying to start a new religion. I think he was trying to clean up Judaism, to reform Judaism. He wasn't trying to create a rival religion. His earliest followers followed him within the context of the synagogue, within the context of Jewish identities. These so-called followers of the way didn't become a separate religion until they were kicked out of the synagogue, probably sometime around the year 88. And I don't blame the synagogue for kicking them out. Some of them wanted to welcome non-Jews into the communities of followers of the way. And others were continuing to push Jesus' reform movement within Judaism. And those groups may well have overlapped, probably did. Don't change us, go do your own thing is essentially what they were told. And so Christianity was born. So I'm a Christian as much by virtue of the followers of the way being kicked out of the synagogue as I am by being a follower of Jesus himself. I suppose otherwise I'd just be a Jesus-y Jew. But I'm not sure how much that helps us know what is meant, what it means to be a church, other than being a church having something to do with following the way of Jesus. Not that following the way of Jesus is exactly a little thing. In fact, I think it is the central thing. Thank you for that Twitter of laughter. Still, I think there is more to say about being a church. We may talk about the church as being that building at 36600 Niles Boulevard, but that's not truly accurate. The early Congregationalists in the Americas referred to the place that they gathered not as their church, but as their meeting house. It's where they met together. It was a place for the meeting of worship. This cartoon, I think, more accurately points to where to find the church than a street address. 
the church is not a building at a particular location. It is the people. And the people spend most of the week outside that building. The state may require us to define that community with articles of incorporation and bylaws, but that's only our legal definition. A church is truly held together, not by that legal definition, but by covenant, by sacred promise. And covenant is not just a promise among people. It is a promise between people and God as well. That's another way that being church is different from being a service club or a community nonprofit. The relationships that are of concern for us are with each other and with humanity, yes, and we are concerned about our relationships with God. Because God is a partner in this process. Because God is a partner with us in covenant. Our sense of purpose, our sense of mission always includes a call to be in service of God's concern for the world. Our covenant is part of the lineage of covenants that God has made, established to call us out into the world. God promised Abraham and Sarah, calling them out into the world, that their descendants would be bless the entire world. God called the Hebrews to be a holy nation in the Sinai covenant. Isaiah says that Israel is a light to the nations. And in the letter that we call First Peter, we're told that Christians are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. We live out this covenant identity by being, as some theologians have said, a sign, a foretaste, and an instrument of the kingdom of God. This makes me think about our church's mission statement, how we have articulated our sense of call in this time in our life together as church. Following the example of Jesus, Niles Discovery Church welcomes all people, grows in our relationships with God and each other, and serves our neighbors near and far. Of course, churches, ours included, don't always embody this foretaste of the kingdom of God. We are, after all, a collection of people. And as the quote for reflection reminds us, the quote that's on the cover of your announcement bulletin, the church is not full of hypocrites. There is always room for more. <laughs> Paul was reminding us in our reading from Romans that the struggle is real. While God is calling us to follow the example of Jesus with radically inclusive love, deepening relationship with God and each other, and service for and with our neighbors, the world is calling us to other ways, grounded in other values. And that's why he calls the church in Rome and us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed so we are able to discern the will of God. When he uses a metaphor for the church that he's used before, he particularly uses in his correspondence with the church in Corinth, the church as a body, the body of Christ today. We each have different gifts, abilities, and passions, and that's for the good of the body. We are to use the gifts that we have been given to help carry out the will of God that we discern. And then he talks about how the church life, the community of followers of Jesus need to live their lives grounded in love. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good, he writes. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. I do not think that this is an exhaustive list. 
It is just the beginning of a list of what it means to live as church. He's pointing out here how we are to live together. And then he gets radical. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. But this should not surprise us. This is exactly what we're told Jesus did when he was crucified. This is the way of Jesus, offering forgiveness even to the least deserving. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably not just with each other, but with all. So I've wandered a bit in this sermon. Let me try to pull together my three main points. Being a church means being connected to God and God's purposes. Being a church means following the way of Jesus to build that connectedness to God and God's purpose. And being a church means being in covenant with each other and with God as we seek and fail and seek again to live a life based in love. Amen.